the celebration of 500 years of uh, European contact, which is basically the commemoration of, of Columbus. It is a opportunity for Indian people to tell their story, something that has to be, I think, uh, very important for Pueblo people because uh, there are always two sides to a story and uh, there is not just one way of looking at history but many ways. Funding for this program has been provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by the financial support of viewers like you. Additional funding has been provided by the Rockefeller Foundation and the Native American Public Broadcasting Consortium. I make my living telling stories, stories about human life, human tragedy, human drama. Living in a place like Los Angeles is so different from the place where I grew up, that place that I call home where my people are, my family, my clan. And that's probably the reason why I return home as much as I can. Born and raised in this house coming up over here, so close to the tracks, and I remember as a kid standing outside my mother's house and watching the trains go by, you know, the uh, sleek red and silver trains. It's the village where I grew up. Played among these hills, played with most of the children here. And, brings back a lot of memories. I remember going to school and being taught that Columbus discovered America, a land populated by brutal savages who had to be conquered, converted, and civilized. In the official version of history, it always seemed better to be white than to be Indian. But at night when I came home to my family, my grandparents, especially my great-grandfather, would tell us stories and legends, myths about our past, about our history. That began long before Christopher Columbus set sail before Spain was a nation, and even before Christ was born. This then is our story, my story, a living story, a story of how Pueblo people have survived. The rock was very soft. Where mm. you find footprints, I used to where they used to stand to watch the sun over here. I don't know if it's still there. There's footprints there, moccasin prints. Where I spring down here. Mm. Uh. Always tell a story from the beginning. That's what Pueblo elders used to tell us. Telling a story is re-knowing the experience. This is the way all things have always been. As a little girl, I stayed with my 
grandparents and they would, you know, she would tell me, you know, long ago tales and she told me that one day two spider sisters came out of a hole in the ground and they saw all the beauty that surrounds Akuma. The mesas, beautiful mesas, the pinyon trees, cedar trees, all around was beautiful. So they went back in and told the Huchan, that's the chief of the tribe. And they told him, it's so pretty up there, why don't we move, you know, up there. Everything is so beautiful. So the Huchan got the, the Kokopelli, the humpback flute player to lead the people out from the underworld into the world we live in now. When people found a place they wanted to settle, they of course could not do it uh, just by themselves. They always had to talk to other animals. They had to talk to the rainbow, they had to talk to the water spider and uh, say, how does this feel to you? Does this feel like, like we've arrived at some place where the energies are swirling and, and this is a place that we can give ourselves to? After their emergence from that world beneath, that place called Shibab. Our ancestors set off to find the center of this world, the middle place of a spiritual landscape. It's here that they created one of the most highly evolved civilizations ever known. Cities like Chaco Canyon, Mesa Verde, Aztec, and Canyon de Chez stand in testimony to a complex highly sophisticated culture. Pueblo culture was in formation about the time of Christ. And of course, it all picked up steam in the centuries between 900 and about 1350 AD, when the largest towns were occupied and the most architecturally complex cities were built and the Pueblo culture extended at its zenith from uh, Las Vegas, New Mexico to Las Vegas, Nevada on an east to west uh, range and from Durango, Colorado to Durango, Mexico, north to south. It was a very vast range. There's a story in Acoma history that talks about a place like Chaco Canyon, a place called Kashkart, a place where Akama people migrated from. I remember my grandparents going to Chaco Canyon and taking prayer bundles with them. And late at night as they were praying, my grandmother later told me she thought she heard someone, somebody singing. It not only frightened her, but maybe even at the same time, delighted her to know that there was still this connection between what had been and what is now. What we're told as children is that people, when they walk on the land, leave their sweat and they leave their breath wherever they go. So that wherever we walk, the place, that particular spot on the earth never forgets us. And when we go back to those places, 
we know that the people who have lived there are in some way still there and that we can actually partake of their breath and of their of their spirit and that's another incredible source of power Pueblo life is always close to the earth. The traditional homes of stone and adobe, the red, yellow, and white mesa cliffs and sandstone canyons into which they blend. This closeness is in the agrarian way of life. The link is there between our land and people, our homes, our art, and our religion. It is in the colors of our skin and hair and our clothing and food, just as it is in the natural earth and sky all around. What makes Pueblo culture so unique is its special relationship to the land. The mountains, the deserts, and the rivers are not resources to be exploited, but are a sacred landscape. We don't own the land, we belong to it. The land is, is part of a, uh, a ceremonial universe. In literally the shrine systems that exist in the center of the community and around the community and at mountaintops as far as you can see. And it defines who you are and where you are now but I think very much it defines the origin as well as the destination, the destiny of a person. You can look back to the old members' pottery and you see depictions of people. You can look at petroglyphs and, and rock art and you see that occurrences in people's lives were being recorded. And there is that presence there that really indicates that people are aware of where they came from and who they are. And they were leaving um, images for other people to see. Each family has their, you know, own own designs, you know, that, you know, their their mothers, their grandmas, you know, that this is the way they paint it. And so it's, you know, it's just passed down, you know, it's just, we just keep on doing it. When my mother was real sick, uh, I told her that my daughter had called from Phoenix. And I told her, I said, she, she did a pottery with a parrot design. That is one of our oldest designs. And I hugged my mother and I told her, oh mother, you're gonna live forever through your designs. I said, well, you know, people will always see, always see the beauty that you have left with us all. All this you have left, I said, don't be so sad, I said, uh, because we will carry on this. Some of our ancestors moved closer to the Rio Grande so that their villages of stone and adobe were strung along the river and its tributaries like beads upon a string of water. In the west, other groups concentrated around desert water sources in Akama, in Zuni, and Hopi. The, the movement through the land by the people uh, is very significant and is, and is part of all Pueblo myths. It's part of that emulation of movement that was seen in the, uh, in the natural environment. One that is always talked about in, in songs, prayers, is the movement of the clouds, how the rain comes from the father source and fertilizes the mother earth. And then out of that, everything grows. Pueblo life before the Europeans arrived consisted of uh, farming and supplementing their, their farming by hunting. Buffalo, antelope, deer. And because this is a uh, semi-arid country, low rainfall, 
they spent much of their time uh, fasting or praying for good weather and uh, other times they spent dancing to ask for more animals during the winter months they have buffalo dance deer dance so that they hope that more will be available when hunting season comes around On the eve of the first contact with European culture, the Pueblo people comprised a peaceful, highly successful civilization made up of over a hundred Pueblos of 50,000 people speaking eight sovereign languages. It was a multitude of differing customs, but one common culture. We saw it in our dreams, in our dark nighttime knowings, that a white man would come from the south we did not understand what the nighttime knew, that these men would take our corn, our cornmeal, our bodies, use them, throw them against the ground with disdain, with disdain for both us and the ground, for our place, for our lives. It was a bad wind against which we tightened our blankets, closed our eyes, and waited the wind to pass. The wind passed, but we were left with the men in metal, with diseases which rotted our bodies, with dying children. Our nighttime voices warned of more to come. One afternoon in May of 1539, in the Zuni Pueblo of Hawiku, the Pueblo world was changed forever because of a Spanish myth, a dream of seven cities of gold. Less than 50 years after the voyage of Columbus, this dream of golden cities waiting to be plundered drove men thousands of miles across seas of sand and stark mountains. Ironically, the first white man to contact Pueblo people was Estebanico, a black slave from Azimor, Morocco. Estebanico was the guide for Fray Marcos de Nisa's expedition to find the seven cities of gold. He was the first black man who was representing the, uh, the Spaniards and who, who, who told the Zunis when he arrived that he was representing white men they were following that were more powerful than he was, and that he, they, they had to obey uh, things that he was asking for. And I'm sure he was asking for, for food, for shelter, for, um, for gifts, and probably, probably women also. And in the meantime, had been hearing rumors of slave raids up into the, into the northern part of Sonora, where there was uh, many, many slave raids, where whole villages were killed off uh, by, the, by the slave raiders, taking all the, all the men, women, and, and children, and killing all the older men and women, and, uh, and leaving, uh, taking them into, into slavery. And so they were afraid that he was one of, the, uh, one of the slave spies. Estebanico and the rumors of slave raids have long since entered Zuni legend. 
over the centuries, the actual events have receded until only faint echoes remain in the stories of giants and magic rattles. But then, Pueblo history is history through storytelling, history through legend. Estevan learned a few tricks in his, uh, of the trade of being medicine man. So he sent this gourd that he had that was uh, supposed to be his medicine gourd, which had uh, two feathers, one white one and one red one, and a couple of copper bells. And uh, at that point, the Zuni chiefs, uh, the war chiefs, uh, flung the gourd to the ground and said, this is not from our people. This is not, this, this person must be a spy. It's going to hide us. The Zuni treated Estebanico like any other spy. They confined him in a house outside the Pueblo walls. But one morning in May 1539, Estebanico tried to flee and was killed. When Fray Marcos de Nisa heard about Estebanico's death, he turned around and sped back to Mexico without seeing the country he called Cibola. His lack of first-hand knowledge did not prevent him, though, from inventing the tale of the seven golden cities of Cibola. Cibola has the appearance of a very beautiful town. The city is bigger than the city of Mexico, and it is the least of the seven cities. There is much gold and the natives trade in vessels and jewels. Fray Marcos's lies and exaggerations soon ignited Spanish greed for gold. One year later in 1540, an expedition led by Francisco Vázquez de Coronado came to Zuni to find the treasure of the seven cities of Cibola. Coronado brought with him 300 Spanish soldiers, a thousand Mexican Indians, guns, cannons, crossbows, and warhounds. Banners were waving, armor was shining. Coronado was arriving right at the most important religious period of time. They were arriving at the summer solstice for the pilgrimage. When the pilgrims are out on their journey, going to and coming from the sacred lake, nobody must cross, the, cross their path because that, that cuts off the rain uh, wishes of the, the people that are performing the ceremonies. As they approached, the uh, high priest and the, uh, the various bow priests forming the front line uh, spread a line of cornmeal, which is a symbol for do not enter now. Do not enter now because we don't want you to interrupt our ceremony. And of course, they um, did just that. They violated the Zuni ritual taboo. And that was a terrible thing to do. And violence was inevitable after that. Against the peaceful Zuni, European military techniques and weapons resulted in a quick victory. The Spanish, however, were bitterly disappointed. There was no gold, no precious jewels. 
When the Spaniards first saw the village, which was Cibola, such were the curses that they hurled at Fray Marcos, that I pray God may protect him from them. It is a crowded little village, looking as if it had been all crumpled together. After hearing about the arrival of the Spanish, the people of Pecos Pueblo sent two of their most important men, including a man who the world would come to know only as Bigotes, the man with a mustache. Bigotes led the Spanish on a tour of the Pueblos, perhaps hoping to show Coronado that the Pueblos lacked the gold and the treasures that they sought. Bigotes was a war chief, or at least a war captain, and in the company of one of his leaders, very likely a cacique, they made plans to go out to Zuni to look into the situations themselves. And Bigotes was able to bring them out to his country to show them the place first, but at the same time, the idea of the Spaniards was that maybe there was something that they were looking for further east from Zuni. The Pueblos were not the cities of gold the Spanish sought, but the collapse of the myth of the seven cities of Cibola only made the Spanish ripe for an even bigger lie, the legend of Quivira. Quivira was a land where rich lords drifted along a river in gold-draped barges and ate from golden plates. In their efforts to prove the existence of Quivira, Coronado threw Bigotes in chains and set the warhounds on him. The Pueblo peoples near Coronado's camp were also learning the true nature of the invaders. Constant Spanish demands for food, blankets, and clothing, coupled with the rape of a Pueblo woman, ignited a rebellion among the Tiwa. After the Pueblo of Arenal had been set ablaze, the Pueblo people surrendered of their own accord. As Cardenas had been ordered by Coronado not to take them alive, but to make an example of them, so that the other natives would fear the Spaniards, he ordered 200 stakes prepared at once to burn them alive. Then, when the enemy saw that the Spaniards were binding them and beginning to roast them, about a hundred men who were in the tent began to struggle and defend themselves. Our men, who were on foot, attacked the tent on all sides, so that there was great confusion around it. And then, the horsemen chased those who escaped. As the country was level, not a man of them remained alive, unless it was some who remained hidden in the village and escaped that night to spread throughout the countryside the news that the strangers did not respect the peace they had made. The Pueblos of the Tiwa were abandoned, like so many Pueblos would be in the future, their peoples pacified by death and destruction. Coronado pushed on to Kansas, only to find that Quivira was yet another lie. And without gold, Spanish interest quickly waned and the expedition retreated, leaving the Pueblos in relative peace for yet another 50 years. Coronado may be a knight or an explorer uh, and a pioneer to Spanish people and to Euro-American peoples in general, but from a Pueblo perspective, he was a disaster. You know, his expedition might better be termed a destructive rampage through Pueblo country. Really, it was Coronado, by behavior, who was a savage. So what does the conquered call her conqueror? What name does the victim give her victimizer? What is the proper name of the man who brings a bewildering storm of people, wagons, guns, strange ways, and a cold philosophy of fear into your beautiful, peaceful place? What right sound and true image conveys the psyche of the man who reeks 
unspeakable sacrilege and does not know he does. The name of the conqueror is not discoverer. The name of the victimizer is not pacifist. The name of the conqueror is fear and death. The name of the victimizer is hunger and loss. One morning in 1598, 400 soldiers, colonists, priests, Mexican Indian servants, and black slaves gathered on the banks of the Rio Grande, hundreds of miles to the south of Pueblo country. On April 30th, 1598, day of ascension of our Lord, at this Rio del Norte, Governor Don Juan de Oñate took possession of all the kingdoms and provinces of New Mexico in the name of King Felipe. The Spaniards who came into the Southwest were imbued, as were all Europeans of the age of discovery, with the peculiar notion that they owned the whole heaven and the whole earth, and that any lands that were not already occupied by Europeans were theirs by right of discovery to do with as they wished. When the Spanish arrived in New Mexico, they established their first capital in San Juan Pueblo. It was clear that this group of invaders was different from Coronado's expedition. They brought their families, mission supplies, wheat seed, fruit trees, and thousands of horses, cattle, sheep, pigs, and chickens. The Spanish were here to stay. When the Spanish were coming from the south, I suppose, that was where they were coming from, the, each pueblo where they stopped at, they were driven off. And then when they came to San Juan, they were on the other side of the river, and the people had heard about them being driven off from the other places, so they were going to do the same, and they had a meeting. But then the governor that they had there then was one who had compassion, and he talked to his people, and he said, why do we want to treat them in this manner? They have families, they have children to raise. The, they have to feed their families, and we can't be mean. We'll let them stay on and let them raise their family, let them raise a crop. The reason we're called Pueblo Indians is because when the Spaniards came through our country, they found our Indian people living in towns and in villages. So Pueblo is a Spanish word, word which means town or village. They classified us. Their only classification they knew, of course, was Pueblo Indians or town or village Indians. One of the first things the Spanish taught the San Juan people was the dance of the Moors and Christians, a dance that celebrated the invincibility of Spanish arms and European religion. Although the dance has changed over 400 years, the Matachina is still being danced in San Juan on Christmas Day. The uh, Matachina dance is known to us as Matachina and represents Christianity. And, and the uh, main dancer uh, represents the king and the little girl that uh, dances with the men represents the Blessed Virgin Mary. And there are uh, 10 dancers, and these dancers represent the uh, 10 beads on a rosary. Uh, this is how uh, we celebrate the uh, birth of Jesus Christ, and he's coming into the uh, Pueblo, and uh, basically reminds us that uh, we not only have our traditional way of life, but the uh, legacy or the tradition of uh, being Catholic is uh, passed on to, to the people.
in the Catholic Church. Mm. 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 I guess I guess the 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 uh, they wanted to Christianize the the people here, the tribe here. We have to look also at who were the people who came to settle. Although they were families, this was not a this place was not settled uh, by Spaniards who were uh, tied to being farmers, tied to the crafts or anything like that. They were basically people who wanted to to colonize and uh, and use an available labor source here. We send people out every month in various directions to bring maize from the pueblos. The feelings of the natives against supplying it cannot be exaggerated, for they weep and cry out as if they and all of their descendants were being killed. The Spaniards seize their blankets by force, leaving their poor Indian women stark naked, holding their babies to their breasts. At Acoma, the demands of a small Spanish force, led by Oñati's nephew, Juan de Zadivar, provoked a fierce battle. Pueblo warriors poured out of the houses and killed Zadivar and 13 other Spanish soldiers. When he heard the news, Oñati moved quickly to crush this rebellion by ordering Zadivar's own brother, Vicente, to lead the attack on Acoma. Many of the Spanish soldiers who were there were either thrown off the Mesa or were in some way hurt by the Acoma Indians. His brother came in with the idea of revenge, with the idea of getting back at these people who had killed his brother and, and had hurt so many and killed so many Spaniards. Led by Vicente de Zadivar, 70 Spanish soldiers arrived at the steep cliffs of Acoma and methodically prepared for a European war without order. Against cannons, muskets, crossbows, steel swords, and war horses, the Acoma people held out for three days. Vicente de Saldivar ordered the Kivas and living quarters to be set on fire. Many were burned alive in those places, men and women, some with children in arms. Others were suffocated by the smoke. Those who refused to surrender were dragged before Zadivar and hacked to pieces, their limbs, heads, and bodies thrown over the cliff. The Spanish lost a single man, while 800 Acomas died. A line of 500 men, women, and children were led down from the Pueblo and brought to Santo Domingo to stand trial before Oñate for rebelling against the King of Spain. The males who are over 25 years of age, I sentence to have one foot cut off and to 20 years of personal servitude. The males between the ages of 12 and 25, I sentence likewise to 20 years of personal servitude. Shocked by the severity of the sentences, the Spanish settlers brought charges against Oñate and Zaldivar, who were found guilty fined, and banished from New Mexico. Still, these European invaders continued their efforts to impose the feudal world of 17th century Spain on the Pueblo people. We were considered the property of an unseen king and his armored servants. We were forced to pray to a cross and European saints and follow the rules of an invisible pope and his all too visible missionaries. The church and the state in the early colonial period had uh, similar goals. I would say the political perspective was of course one to, uh, to subjugate politically and to control within a feudal system and the church's view was to Christianize and to convert and to save souls. 
and these two coincided as the encomienda, as the encomienda system was uh, formalized uh, and implemented where they could use Indian labor, uh, there were the your missions, which were to missionize, right, to Christianize. The encomienda and the repartimiento systems were the basic economic systems that were imposed on, on native people of New Mexico. And all of a sudden, there comes this, these invaders who begin to tell you, well, things are going to change here now. Uh, you, can't, you can't leave your pueblo, you can't travel as far as you want anymore because we don't want you leaving your area. They began to cut up the land and for the Pueblo people, they were told how much of the land was now theirs. So you get the idea of, of uh, owning other people uh, for yourself. What an incredible, strange foreign notion, you know, uh, when we talk about that other world. The Spanish imposed a governmental system on the Pueblos whereby governors ran the civil part of tribal life. In 1623, the Spanish gave each Pueblo governor a cane as a symbol of authority. One of the most symbolic gestures that has elevated this whole notion of our status of sovereign entities over the last 400 years has been the issuance of, of canes by various sovereigns of the world. A traditional passing of authority annually among Pueblo officials is a passing of, of the canes, which symbolize the sovereign status of our governments. <laughs> I remember elders in my family talking about how when the mission at Acoma was being constructed, being built, how Pueblo people there had been basically placed into slavery and made to work until they dropped dead. And yet, ironically, now, three, four hundred years later, we celebrate, you know, with the feast days. We dance inside the mission. We revere Christianity. Well, when the Spaniards first came up into northern New Mexico, one of the first things that they did was to build churches. And they utilized Indian labor to build those churches and later on to maintain those churches. And the labor was not voluntary. A price of land was set aside for the priest in which they would plant corn, cultivate corn, squash, and things of that sort to maintain the missionary household. The church as a whole, because of its theological position, would begin to would look at the Indian religion as probably superstition and witchcraft. So, from time to time, people were punished for that. For, and I think the church was uh, was concerned with creating a unified uh, worldview, and, and it's not only converting people and saving souls, but also getting a a perspective from the Indians that would support the medieval uh, Catholic worldview of the of the Spaniard. The missionary program involved the attempted destruction of all semblance of the indigenous religions, the filling in of kivas, the destruction and burning of Pachina Mass, the outlawing of the dances, the reporting of people who were involved in the practice of the traditional indigenous religion. There were three missions that were built on Hopi during that period of time. The priests were so isolated that they pretty much made their own rules. Uh, and uh, they made claims on uh, women reaching puberty. They were uh, said to be the first to, to have these young women reaching the age of puberty. 
before they were before the the girls were free to participate in the rest of the social marital institutions of of Hopi, and that this apparently, according to the stories, uh, was the the last straw. In their efforts to destroy our religion, the missionaries try to separate sons from the knowledge of their fathers and daughters from the world of their mothers. Christianity would have destroyed our culture, our relationship to the Earth Mother herself. We did not consent to the eradication of our world. Gran Quivira Atampiro Pueblo, abandoned in 1672, was one of the victims of the great contraction of the Pueblo world. It was a time when the world was out of balance. It was a time of death. The rain ceased to fall. The corn withered. Thousands of Pueblo people died in a great famine. For three years, no crop has been harvested. Last year, 1668, a great many Indians perished of hunger, lying dead along the roads, in the ravines, and in their hovels. That year, thousands died of starvation in Gran Quivira, Curay, and other pueblos. The elders and the children were the first to die, leaving a society bereft of its past and its future. Giving food to the missionaries and giving food to the Spanish colonizers had a, had a tremendous impact on the Pueblo economies. For example, at Taos, where the climate varies from season to season, and some seasons where you were able to reap a lot of corn and other years not being able to do that. Um, some years being lean in terms of hunting for venison and some days, some years not. So it did have a tremendous impact on the economy. Uh, many people were not eating as well as they used to. The Apaches had mastered the horse, upsetting the balance between the Pueblo peoples and their nomadic neighbors. Their raids on the Pueblos came with increasing frequency. And then there was disease, a disease that struck both Indian and European. The Spanish attributed the deaths to witchcraft by Pueblo sorcerers. In 1675, the Spanish governor finally heeded the cause of the missionaries and arrested 47 alleged sorcerers and brought them to trial. Naturally, the uh, case was against them and uh, four men were condemned to die and the others were to be whipped publicly. One of the men that was whipped was a man from San Juan Pueblo whose name was Pope Ing, and the Spaniards called him Pope. He began to think about what should be done to retaliate. Pope decided to uh, go to Taos Pueblo, far away from the center of uh, Spanish activity, and Taos needs to be given credit for uh, giving protection to him and all the others that were planning the revolt. The decision to fight, to go to war, probably took a lot of soul searching, a lot of input from various factions, various groups, various clans, various leaders within the Pueblo. And then to unite all the Pueblos to unite each of these sovereign nations in a united effort to drive the Spaniards out of their lands. There must have been an awful lot of suffering that occurred that eventually drove them to that point. It was a very ingenious plan, first of all, to communicate this plan to have the rebellion it consisted of messengers running to all the various pueblos in New Mexico and into Arizona and informing them that this is going to happen, that they would create their own little rebellion within the village and 
and kill the intruders. The three spirits told Pope to make a cord of maguey fiber and tie some knots in it, which would signify the number of days that they must wait for the rebellion. The cord was taken from Pueblo to Pueblo by the swiftest youths under the penalty of death if they reveal the secret. Two young men were appointed to carry the knotted rope, and each day as the sun came up, a knot would be untied. And on the last day that the knot was untied would be the day the action would begin. It didn't happen the way it was really planned. The two boys were discovered, they were brought to Santa Fe for trial. When the Tuzuki people learned about it, they became extremely alarmed. Consequently, they killed a Spaniard that was at Tuzuki. This was the beginning of the first successful revolt by a Native American organization against the Europeans. On August 10, 1680, the Pueblo warriors, by design, uh, attacked the uh, churches. August 10th uh, happens to be St. Lorenzo's Day, and so the people knew that uh, both Indian and non-Indians would be congregated in church. And uh, it was in re retaliation for what the, the uh, church and civil authorities were doing to the Pueblo people. Most of the villages, the churches were destroyed, and those people who were accepting of the Catholic faith were ousted from their villages, if not killed. All of the Pueblos uh, under the Spanish rule rose up against the yoke of Spain and in some cases as a Hopi killed uh, the uh, priests, the Franciscan priests. Within three days over 400 Spaniards, men, women and children lay dead. 21 of New Mexico's 33 priests were killed. Churches, crosses, saints, and the symbols of Christianity were burned and destroyed. The Spanish governor and most of the colonists were trapped in Santa Fe, besieged by thousands of Pueblo warriors. Indians from the Pueblos of Peco, San Cristobal, San Lázaro, San Marcos, Galisteo, and Cienega are one league from the Villa of Santa Fe on the way to attack it and destroy the governor and all the Spaniards. They're saying that now God and Santa Maria were dead, and that their own God, whom they obey, never died. They had a, a few days of standoff here. The uh, Spanish guns, arquebus against Pueblo, bows and arrows, clubs and stones. Naturally, the Pueblos were at a disadvantage, but soon decided that the only way they could dislodge the Spaniards were to cut up the water. A few days later, the Spaniards had no water for themselves nor their animals. Every day of the nine days which the siege of Santa Fe lasted, more and more people assembled until the beasts and the cattle began to die because we had been entirely cut off from water. Being agreed that it was better to die fighting, his lordship advanced, and invoking the name of the Virgin, he routed and overran them and massacred more than 300 Indians. 47 Indians were taken prisoner in their houses. They were executed. But finding ourselves out of provisions with very few horses, Threatened by the enemy and not being assured of war, it is necessary to leave. We have decided to withdraw. The Pueblo peoples had a chance during the siege of Santa Fe to wipe out all of the Spaniards. And they stood to one side when their siege worked and the Spaniards silently filed out 
heading southward on their remaining horses and carrying what possessions they could carry. The Pueblo World Warriors made no effort to attack them. They just let them leave. We are at quits with the Spaniards and the persons we have killed. Those of us whom they have killed do not matter, for the Spaniards are going, and now we shall live as we like. The uh, period uh, after the revolt, it's recorded that the Pueblo people uh, went down to the river, cleansed themselves. Uh, they did away uh, with uh, many of the things that the Spaniards brought. For example, they burned uh, the orchards and uh, tried to, to again be pure uh, Pueblo people again. It was a very joyous time for them. It was a time of um, relearning what had been lost in the past. And there was also a sense of threat as well that existed because they knew that there would be other people to come in. They knew that they weren't completely safe from the Spaniards. During the 12 years that the Pueblo world was free from European domination, the Spanish sent a number of armed expeditions to reclaim their kingdom. In the Pueblo of Alameda, the Spaniards found a man who, unable to flee, hung himself rather than be captured by the Spanish. There would not be much of a Pueblo culture left over if the Pueblo people of 1680 had not taken the action they did. They acted to save their culture, to save their integrity of communities, and to save their self-respect, which the Spaniards were rapidly withering away with their onslaughts on their religion, on their labor, on their politics, on their very independence. And so it's in that sense, the sense that Pueblo culture survives late into the 20th century that we must honor and commemorate the Pueblo Revolt of 1680. There was no mention in the textbooks that I read of the Pueblo Revolt. There was never any mention of the kind of treatment of Pueblo people at the hands of Spaniards in the textbooks that I read. There was never anything said about our survival, our efforts to survive. And I think it's only now that our story be told. Freedom gives life. Freedom is life. The Indian Pueblo revolt of 1680 gave life. We exist today as Indian communities because of the revolt. Now our Pueblo people knew it was the time to be patient and determined to be enduring. Now we, the people, were to keep struggling for the existence of all things in creation. The Pueblo Revolt brought 12 years of freedom for our people. But in 1692, Don Diego de Vargas visited the Pueblos with promises of peace, and our leaders agreed to let the Spanish return. Each year in Santa Fe, the so-called peaceful reconquest of New Mexico was celebrated, complete with Indians dressed in Hollywood costumes and looking happy to see their conquerors. Unfortunately, the real reconquest began when de Vargas returned with settlers, priests, and canons. The coming of uh, de Vargas back into New Mexico has been depicted as one of being a bloodless conquest, but uh, we know different that uh, de Vargas was just as brutal as Coronado and Oñate. However, we've, you know, we've managed to survive and 
And I think there's a lesson there for, for all peoples in terms of uh, enduring uh, atrocities uh, imposed on, on people. The first thing that de Vargas did after a long night of siege of the Villa Real de Santa Fe was to order some 80 Pueblo Indian warriors to be shot, uh, summarily shot. And the remaining 400, mostly women and children, were ordered to be partitioned out to Spanish families to serve as servants. Two years later, another revolt broke out, only to be put down by Governor de Vargas and his Pueblo allies. While individual Pueblos would continue to resist whenever their way of life was threatened, the Spanish had regained control, but they had also learned tolerance and respect for the Pueblo peoples. While the relationship to the Spanish improved, the world was still violently out of balance. Once living Pueblos were now abandoned to the wind. A Pueblo world that once held 50,000 people and 100 Pueblos was reduced to 14,000 people and 22 Pueblos. The whole land is at war with the very numerous nation of the heathen Apache Indians who kill all the Christian Indians they encounter. No road is safe. The Apaches hurl themselves at danger like a people who know not God, nor that there is a hell. By the 18th century, violent raids had become all too common by other nomadic tribes the Navajos, Utes, and the fierce Comanche, who were not only mounted on the descendants of Spanish horses, but armed with French guns. With the introduction of the horse, it just made it more difficult for the Pueblo Indians to, to, um, to secure their Pueblos from, from outside intervention. It enabled the mounted raiders to appear and disappear very quickly. And it made them highly efficient as raiders, as well as, as warriors. The Spaniards and Pueblo peoples needed to pool every resource at their command to protect themselves effectively. The need, just based on survival, for, for Pueblo people to not only defend themselves, but defend themselves very well, uh, there grew uh, among the northern Pueblos a uh, class of uh, warriors. Uh, because of the many, many different kinds of engagements which they were called upon, either individually or through uh, acting as a part of the Spanish militia. The Tewas especially, and also the Tiwas uh, in northern New Mexico, uh, became very well known for their fighting ability. The alliance between the Pueblos and the Hispanos after uh, 1692 was in a, in a way a, a, an alliance of convenience, I would say, in terms of protection against the, the Plains Indians or the Indians who were uh, roaming the, the Llano Estacado and the Plains. And this, this forced the villagers in the, both villages, the Indian as well as uh, Hispanos, to, be, to come closer together. The alliance of Pueblo Indians and Hispanic farmers and ranchers would last into the 20th century but its roots went far beyond the need for defense. I think the alliance between the Pueblo people and the Spanish really was part of working with the land. When the Spanish came to the Southwest and found that there was no gold here or wealth, great riches to be had, they still had to survive, find a way to survive, and they had really had to then cooperate or find out how the Pueblo people were doing it. The earth remains the symbol of the place where people connect. What was happening right after the revolt was a search for common ground. That common ground uh, was found 
uh, first uh, primarily through uh, trying to establish an understanding of each other's ways um, and also finally or secondly uh, through a process of coming to terms with, with, with living in this place which is New Mexico there was indeed a new kind of Spaniard primarily an individual who was looking indeed to make New Mexico their home. After the Spanish returned, they recognized Pueblo lands through a series of land grants. This legal recognition of our lands, the center places of our world, would be crucial to our existence in the centuries to come. Under the Spanish flag, we were well protected by under the uh, laws of the Indies, which were Spanish policies. We were given land grants, which we still have today, cannot be touched by any government. But reaching an accommodation with the church was far more difficult. The clergy and civil authorities still sought to replace our traditional beliefs with Christianity. Again, there was a reassertion of uh, Catholicism and the pressure to convert a number of different Pueblos uh, attempted to convert outwardly and yet at the same time practice their own traditional native religious practices as they had always done. And that, of course, varied from Pueblo to Pueblo. Each Pueblo uh, evolved and developed uh, their own kinds of strategies in relationship to the specific kinds of things that they were faced. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of Even God, to this day, my grandmother will, will recite God the Catholic prayers God, in, in Spanish. She'll God, say them in Spanish God, like before she goes to sleep. But yet, my grandmother will go to the Kiva and she'll, she'll dance and she, when, she really, when she really wants to pray, she prays in Indian. She's, she prays in Tiwa. One of the things that we can be thankful for is a foresight of what our forefathers did to take our religion underground so that what we know of today, what has been preserved, our language, our ritual, our ceremonialism, our songs, that they took all of that underground and developed a level of secrecy that still is, a, is very much a part of our way of life so that much of what takes place as the most meaningful in our lives ceremonially, is often close to the public, is often performed at nights. While the Pueblo peoples and most Hispanic settlers depended on subsistence agriculture, there was money to be made in New Mexico through trade. Trade with the same Comanches, Apaches, and Navajos, whose attacks threatened the colony's survival. Every autumn, a great trade fair was held outside of Taos Pueblo. Human beings were one of the most important commodities at these trade fairs. In 1776, the going rate for an Indian girl between 12 and 20 years old was two horses and a blanket. Young men were substantially cheaper. The Comanches would take captives, uh, Pueblo, uh, men and women, and they used people as a sort of medium of trade uh, with the Spanish for goods that they, that they wished to obtain. And many times they would uh, trade with Plains tribes for uh, the captives that the Plains tribes held. Those captives were then uh, inducted into the Spanish uh, households. Uh, and this really is where the uh, Hinacero and Mestizo population began to blossom. Uh, in, in New Mexico during that, uh, that century. Historically, Genizaros re have referred to, uh, to uh, detribalized Indians, Indians that were captured and ransomed by the Spaniards and brought into New Mexico 
and placed uh, in mission communities, select uh, mission communities uh, throughout the state. And these are those are Indians that settled into permanent communities, but they bridged two worlds, the Hispanic world and the Indian world. Most Pueblos had achieved a stable relationship with the Spanish government, the Catholic Church, and their Hispanic and Hinicero neighbors. This stability ended in 1821 with Mexico's independence. While the Mexican period was short, it was marked with the loss of Pueblo lands. The Mexican period, uh, for all intents and purposes, was a very dire a period of time for Pueblo people because of the change in the way that Pueblo people uh, were viewed and also with regard to the way in which Pueblo lands uh, were handled. They were no longer looked upon as being special and uh, as they had been with regard to uh, the case of the Spanish colonial laws and, and that period of time. They uh, were viewed as being just uh, the same as any other Mexican citizen. Uh, in some ways, uh, the selling of land or the loss of land uh, began to really occur uh, extensively. Dissatisfaction with the Mexican government was not restricted to the Pueblos. And in 1837, an alliance of Pueblo leaders Hinisaros and Hispanics flamed into armed rebellion in Santa Cruz and Chimayón. The revolt was crushed. Its Hinisoro leader, José González, who for one brief moment had been New Mexico's only Indian governor, was executed. But the conflict between rich and poor would continue and would become even more severe after the Americans invaded New Mexico in 1846. Well, I'm very lucky to have a grandmother who listened to many of the stories of her grandparents and her great-grandparents. One time when I was a little girl, I went into her bedroom and I saw a saint. And it's, it's always the saint that I thought was the ugliest because it was, well, you know, when you're a child, it was kind of burned out looking and it, you can't really see the face and you can't see the eyes, but you, it's a figure of a saint. And, and I asked my grandma, I said, how come this saint looks so ugly? How come you keep it and you have all these other saints? And, and she told me that that was a saint that was thrown out of the church during the uh, rebellion of 1847. The rebellion of uh, 1847 that took place here at Taos Pueblo was a result of our Taos Pueblo people here having very strong feelings regarding the imposition of, uh, of a different way of life again here in, in this part of the country. Our Taos Pueblo leadership here took a very serious stand about the takeover by the United States government of this area. The last armed struggle of the Pueblo peoples began in January 1847 under the leadership of Tomas Romero from Taos Pueblo. At dawn, a group of Pueblo men, Hispanics and Hinisaros, surrounded the house of the American governor. Instead of fleeing with his family, the governor stayed, only to be killed and scalped by the angry crowd. Five more Americans in Taos died that day, and as the news spread, so did the rebellion to Arroyo Hondo, Mora, and other parts of New Mexico. Armed with artillery and modern guns, the U.S. Army set off from Santa Fe to answer this challenge to American authority. In battles at La Cañada and Ambudo, a poorly armed group of Pueblo men and Hispanic farmers was easily defeated and forced to flee back to Taos and the fortified Pueblo which had protected them so many times from Comanche raids. The Americans were not intimidated by the thick adobe walls. They surrounded the Pueblo and deployed their artillery and began to reduce the village to rubble. 
many of the uh, women and the children here took refuge within the interior of the, uh, the, the large uh, couple of structures. Tunnels were dug from one room to another in order to get to the, uh, the deeper part of the, uh, the village as the soldiers stormed the, uh, the walls of the village. On the second day, the defenders gave up and sent the women and children to the church but any hopes of sanctuary were quickly dispelled by cannon fire. And so when the soldiers came in, there was a lot of fighting that occurred. Fighting broke out and somebody set the church on fire. They started throwing the saints out because they didn't want the saints to burn. And one of my aunts or one of my other uncles caught that saint and that's how we have that saint. Over 150 people died and the Taos revolt ended. The American conquest of New Mexico was complete. The religious leaders were taken to Santa Fe under the pretense of, uh, of negotiations and talks with the uh, representatives of the United States government. Our people never saw these religious leaders again. These men were all hung by the neck until death in Santa Fe. The American conquest of New Mexico did have one benefit, a respite from violent raids by nomadic tribes, which allowed the Pueblo population to increase once again after reaching its lowest level in history in 1850. 7,000 survivors in a world that once contained 50,000 people. Unfortunately, the practice of Indian slavery was accepted and continued by the Americans, even after the Civil War and the freeing of the slaves. American progress finally made an impact on New Mexico. Mining towns popped up overnight, forests were cut down to build houses, and Jemez Pueblo lost its mountains. The transcontinental railroads linked the nation and cut pueblos in half. As I grew up, get being old, old enough to ride horses, I used to herd horses and cows ride along the railroad. I used to see passengers, passengers couldn't come. I used to gallop over there with my horse. I used to go right alongside that, right alongside the railroad, and when the people start waiting at me. I had a long hair, and uh, everything I wore was handmade. And I have uh, always carried bow and arrow in my back to ride around the side of the railroad. I guess those people too. Look at that little Indian, I guess they say. <laughs> the influx of people following upon the railroad, um, and even before, also served to reduce the land base that the Pueblo peoples have been accustomed to using. A lot of Pueblos, of which had traditionally been left alone to graze their horses and cattle, their stock, on certain areas, lost those areas to the aggressive expansionist uh, activities and policies of new ranchers. Along the Rio Grande, the new Anglo-American immigrants pushed Hispanic farmers off their lands. U.S. courts did accept the old Spanish land grants to the Pueblos and to their Hispanic neighbors. All that was required was a simple survey and a review of the grant, a simple procedure that was used to defraud Pueblo people and Hispanics out of hundreds of thousands of acres. The Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo theoretically ended the Mexican-American War. And as provisions of the treaty, the rights of the Pueblo people were to be protected and respected, just as they had been under the government of Mexico. The Pueblos were legal citizens, but there were some disadvantages because we were not recognized as American Indians under the 1834 Trade and Intercourse Act. 
this was an act which was proposed for other Indian tribes to protect them against land speculators and traders. The court encouraged the uh, non-Indians to, to settle into the, uh, well, within the exterior boundaries of the uh, Indian Pueblos. In our case up here, uh, there were something like uh, 3,000 uh, non-Indians who squattered on Indian land, and uh, they, they really uh, refused to give up uh, and to, to go out off the reservation even if they were asked. The government not only stood by as our lands were taken, but actively joined in the theft. In 1906, President Roosevelt created the Carson National Forest. Its heart was the Taos Pueblo's sacred Blue Lake. Our people belong to Mother Earth, just like the trees, the living things, the water, the mountains, everything is a part of Mother Earth. Blue Lake is a part of the, uh, the land that our people have uh, used and occupied for hundreds and hundreds of years. It is uh, a link to our, our origin, a link to our, our past. At the first snow one winter in 1893, a white man came and took all of us on a train to a new kind of village called Carlisle Indian School, and I stayed there seven years. They told us that Indian ways were bad. They said we must get civilized. I remember that word. It means be like the white man. It was a warm summer evening when I got off the train at Tao Station. The first Indian I met, I asked him to run out to the Pueblo and tell my family I was home. The Indian couldn't speak English, and I had forgotten my Pueblo language. All this time, I was a white man. I wore white man's clothes and kept my hair cut. I was not very happy. The federal government decided that maybe they did have some responsibility for uh, educating Indians to become Americans. So they built these uh, boarding schools removed, you know, for the most part from reservations and uh, brought children there, severed from their parents and uh, to, to get them away from their own cultural influences and, and make them into little Americans in those experiments, especially in the 1880s, when the Dawes Act said, we will detribalize Indians. And I think Theodore Roosevelt put it well. He said the Dawes Act was like a mighty machine. It pulverized family and culture. The manifest destiny of the nation has moved up to and sometimes over or through Indian people. Like the Spanish before them, the American conquerors decided that Pueblos could only progress if our religion was eradicated. A new wave of missionaries was unleashed, only this time they were Protestants. And rather than missions, they built schools to teach our children how to speak English and reject the ways of their mothers and fathers as pagan, bestial, and half-animal. When the Americans began to settle in uh, with their own mission of civilizing Indians and making them good little Christians, so by oh, 1860s, uh, they decided to bring uh, the missionaries who were apparently uh, in competition with each other, different kinds of uh, denominations, in competition with each other to see, to get their own territory of Indians to civilize and Christianize. Oh, my father sang, you know, he was singing all the time. And uh, so he said one day, 
one day there was these young young women missionaries coming with a little box, he said, and it was a Victrola. And so my mother went to the door and, and that she said, I'm sorry, but we're Catholics. And so that my father said, oh, let them come in. Let, let them come in. They have a music box. I like to hear music. He says, let them come in. And they're, we're not going to be contaminated. If we didn't know any better, we might, you know, we, we might, uh, you know, turn. And, and so, so then she let them in. And so that they started playing their little music. And, of course, I sat. He said, I liked it. He said, I sat listening, listening to, uh, to the music. And they were talking to us about, about you know, God and and of course they, they they don't understand that we know God more than they do. <laughs> At the beginning of the 20th century, our lands, our religion, and even our children were all under attack. The modern world with all its wonders and problems began to invade once isolated pueblos. The myth of the vanishing American Indian was created. It was only a matter of time, they said, before native cultures were swept away by the march of progress. The modern world had arrived at our doorsteps in trains, cars, and tourist buses. As anthropologists, photographers, and visitors flocked to see our quaint customs before they disappeared. But our people refused to vanish because they knew the beauty of the Pueblo way of life. Generosity, unselfishness, is one of the greatest values that our Indian people taught and especially in my family because my mother and father always say never refuse a stranger, never refuse a person when they come to the house. Those are the things that we had before Columbus came, before education was put upon us and those are the things that I call surviving Columbus. Some of the best moments of my childhood were, were when I knew that feast day was coming. And all this activity would go on, be going on, and I would, of course, have to be a part of helping to make the bread and, and sweeping the yard and sweeping the plaza, helping to plaster, bring the mud. But when the day finally came, I would get this wonderful sensation of walking through the crowds hearing the sound, hearing the beat of the drum. Whether we wanted it or not, the U.S. government decided that our culture, our heritage, would have to be destroyed before we could progress. More boarding schools were built so that all children would be forced to learn the white man's ways and forget those of their parents. We went to a school at Albuquerque Indian School or Santa Fe Indian School. Uh, some went to Haskell and, and other places. Uh, many of us were taken away from home during the time when our culture was at, at its uh, uh, strongest peak. Many of the elders were still living, and uh, I feel that uh, by being a, away from home, uh, we lost out on, on many of the teachings that, that our elders uh, would uh, pass on to the people during the winter time. Yes, there were some negative things happening in the Indian schools because a lot of them were not allowed to talk the Indian language and punished very severely for speaking them if they were caught speaking the language. I went to the day school here in San Juan and then from fifth grade, we get sent to the boarding school in Santa Fe. Then I entered Santa Fe boarding school. I didn't like that at all. Nighttime is when it was lonely. When you go to bed, you have nice clean sheets waiting for you 
a nice bed. But there's no grandfather, there's no grandma there to sit on their lap and listen to the stories. Columbus goes back to Europe and claims that he found a new world. What right did Columbus have to make such a claim? Or what proofs did he have that it was a new world that he found? This world was not lost. Our principal needs today are that you eject all non-Indian trespassers off our lands. Instead of reimbursing the Indian for what land a non-Indian holds, why not reimburse the non-Indian trespasser and make him get off? He knows that he is holding land illegally. Only you know that he won't vote for you if you don't kick us into submission. The U.S. government had taken more than 60 years to realize that we were Native Americans and entitled to the protection of our lands and water rights. It would, however, ignite a legal storm. Another threat that was faced by the Pueblo people came in the 1920s in the form of the Burson Bill. What it proposed to do, basically, was to legalize the rights of squatters on Pueblo lands. It would leave squatters, uh, both Hispanic and Anglo, right where they were by legalizing their rights to the lands they were living on. If it had been uncontested and gone on through the Congress and been signed into law, it would have probably met the end of Pueblo culture. The failure of Protestant missionaries to eliminate native religions led to yet another assault on Pueblo life, the Religious Crimes Code. In direct violation of the Constitution, the U.S. government made our religion illegal. Until the old customs and Indian practices are broken up among these people, we cannot hope for a great amount of progress. The secret dance is perhaps one of the greatest evils. What goes on I will not attempt to say, but I firmly believe that it is little less than a ribald system of debauchery. Our most fundamental right is threatened and is actually being nullified. Our religion is sacred and is more important to us than anything else in our life. The religious beliefs and ceremonies and forms of prayer of each of our pueblos are as old as the world and they are holy. We Pueblo Indians have not consented to abandon our religion. The government was tempering with something very deep and sincere in the minds of the Pueblo people because uh, the religion the ceremonies, the dances are at the heart of, of who we are. You know, and if, if you start messing with that, people are going to take care of themselves and protect themselves. So very often what happens is, you know, the, the intent is, is one thing, but the result is just the opposite because it just forces people to, to clam up even more, to guard themselves even further than, than ever before. The leadership of the All Indian Pueblo Council and widespread public support defeated these threats. And by the 1930s, the policy of the Bureau of Indian Affairs under John Collier had changed. For the first time, the BIA admitted that it was good and honorable to be an Akama, a Zuni, a Hopi. But at the same time, the Bureau of Indian Affairs tried to impose its political system and federal rules and regulations on our way of life. Uh, out here at Laguna, that was a time that they recall when their sheep had to be driven into uh, pits and slaughtered because of the uh, drought that occurred. But uh, in their own minds, they were able to manage uh, that drought uh, in by rotation of the sheep through various uh, pasture lands. But uh, somebody else came in and imposed uh, certain quotas and limitations on grazing capacity that, uh, that were external. 
but yet they had to live with them. So that was a great period, a great time of devastation. My grandfather used to always talk about the survival of Indian people. And he would always say that it's, there's no question that we as Indian people are going to survive. But the more important question that we should be asking ourselves is how. And that, our answer to that how is the extent to which we continue to m maintain the rights and powers of a sovereign entity. Like other Native Americans, the Pueblo peoples defended the United States in its wars. At home, women and children pitched in to support the boys in the front and the war effort. On Bataan, I was with the uh, 31st Infantry Regiment. We were ambushed. Machine guns started firing all around us and we hit the ground. By the time I looked up, there were Japanese guards all around us with their rifles pointed at us. And then they walked us. We walked, the group I was with, for three days. We walked and walked and walked and walked. I came back. We could not vote. And then I asked myself, why did we go, why did they accept so many Indians drafted, you might say, to be in the armed forces when they're still wards, when we are still wards of the government? We had hoped that World War II would end all possibilities of other wars, but it didn't come out that way. And uh, I thought that if any of our boys had to go to uh, other wars, uh, they should have the right to vote for the people who sent them out there. We had to sue the state of New Mexico before we got the right to vote in 1948. But the changes set in motion by World War II would have an even more profound impact on the Pueblo world. The Pueblo people paid an additional price to defend the country. Lands from San Adafonso Pueblo were taken to create Los Alamos National Laboratory, the top secret research center which developed the atomic bomb. Uranium was discovered at Laguna Pueblo, and bulldozers, earth movers, and dynamite created a vast pit mine. When the armed forces veterans came back, returned home, in the absence of farming, people began to work outside of the Pueblos. Uh, Los Alamos was established as a wartime project, the Manhattan Project. So at least for the northern Pueblos, a large number of Pueblo people began to work at Los Alamos, both men and women. Many had sold their livestock during the uranium boom because they, I guess, couldn't handle livestock and uh, a full-time job. So uh, now, often I hear, I wish I hadn't sold my livestock. I envy you because you still have livestock. But that was another thing that the old timers used to tell us, don't ever sell your livestock because it's food on your table and clothes on your back when the going gets tough. In the 1950s, the U.S. government attempted to terminate its treaty responsibilities for all tribal people and turn administration over to the states. At the same time, the Bureau of Indian Affairs began a program to relocate Indians to urban centers across the country. I have an uncle who was part of that relocation program who has lived in Oakland for over 40 years. Their feeling at the time was that they were going to do the best they could for their children. But one of the devastating outcomes of that is the offspring has rejected 
their parents and are very bitter towards their parents because they never gave them an opportunity to learn about Kochiti, never having an opportunity to learn the language. I think that until the 1970s, not only Indian policy by the federal government, but in a way the reality of making a living or finding a way to stay in the Pueblo was very difficult. Policy said, go away. In 1950, it was, we take you away with the relocation and termination policies. The U.S. government's efforts to destroy native cultures finally ended in the 1970s with the recognition that we were capable of determining our own destinies. The return of Taos's Blue Lake marked the first time the U.S. government actually gave land back to a native people rather than just providing compensation. This victory capped a 60-year-long struggle by a community determined to maintain its sacred relationship to the land. It wasn't until the 1970s that Blue Lake was finally given back to the Taos Indians. It was a time of celebration. I remember seeing my grandmother crying and my grandfather crying in the house. It was at night when we heard the story and heard the news and they were crying and they said, we never have to worry about people desecrating our area. And I remember my, my older brother and I David, we were flashing the lights off and on on the porch light because we were so happy. Blue Lake, a symbol of perseverance, because indeed this was a very strong symbol of a people enduring great hardships, great difficulties, and persevering in what they wanted done in a way of justice for our people, justice for Indian people. While the sacred Blue Lake was returned, other sacred areas were taken. The Acoma people have come to worship in the starkly beautiful lava flow of the Malpai since our Pueblo was built over a thousand years ago. Yet in 1987, these sacred places were made part of a national park and exposed to the influx of tourists. Land is critical to the survival of the Pueblo people in this day and age because, as elders have put it, unless we can bequeath to the children a place on which they may plant their feet as well as their crops or whatever they want to plant, then the community will dissolve. Then they'll scatter like leaves in the autumn. Uh, <laughs> For centuries, our ancestors have successfully defended our culture, religion, and lands against the attacks of the Spanish, Mexican, and American governments. But today, we face perhaps our greatest challenge, how to maintain our existence as Pueblo people in a rapidly changing world replete with alcohol, drugs, AIDS, urban encroachment, and television. At the same time, the traditional roles of Pueblo women are changing as they too enter the workforce. When I was uh, growing up as a child, I, I remember that the role of a woman uh, being in the home, being the nurturer, taking care of the family. But as time changes, I see um, women getting more uh, involved in the working field, um, getting um, education, and because of social economics, we have more single parents that need to get out and work. Now we have more women working in the Pueblo here. The role of the women has changed drastically with uh, times, with, with um, even the, the education that, that women have gotten and, and the career 
that they want and then to try to be a part of Indian life, it's a very difficult role to, to have. It's extremely critical that Indian women hold on to and maintain our lives that involves the traditional aspect of being Indian because if we don't, then we're going to lose it completely because the woman is the most important part of the home when it comes to the teaching of children. And if we're going to have our children continue this way of life, then it's up to us as mothers and teachers to instill all of that in our children. At the same time, traditional family roles are changing. Our culture is also being threatened by an even more severe problem, the loss of our native languages. Language uh, is being lost uh, uh, by the people, and, and when that happens, uh, we have to worry and wonder about how long uh, our traditional uh, dances, our songs and our prayers will uh, continue to survive. The qualities that help the Pueblo people to survive with their culture up till today is first, religion, their native religion. And in order to have their re native religion, they have to have a language. So these are the two outstanding qualities that help the Pueblos to survive, religion and language. You need one to operate the other. It's very hard to be from a community where language is so important, where custom and tradition are so important, and not be a part of it, not to have grown up in it. To not know the language, though, is really difficult. I, I used to talk to my mother about this, because I would ask her about language. I would, I would ask her, um, what are they saying when they say those, uh, when, when they pray? And she would try to explain it to me, and then she would say, I don't know the words. She said, that's, that's, um, she says, I know what they mean, but I can't explain it in English. And she said, I don't even think I could explain it in my own language because those are words that are so special that they feel awkward in my mouth. <laughs> That's good. That's real good. Okay, now that you know that prayer, you have to go every morning to a cornmeal. Okay? Mm -hmm. I think they can learn. I think they can learn how to pray the right way in Indian. And I want them to, if they can. It actually feels good because I feel that I'm learning it. And it just comes to you. We have to say it too. You can't We're Sandia Pueblo Indians, and <laughs> if we don't grow up speaking it, it's like our, it's our responsibility to learn. Okay, 10 plus 1, how would you say 11? All of you. Again? I think for a long time there's been this expressed fear by tribal elders that somehow we were losing something, that as they were pushing their children to get educated, they were at the same time sacrificing their own tradition, their language, their culture. What am I asking you? Anybody? I know it would be very sad for me if they do lose the culture but I still want for them to carry it on. And that's one of the reasons why I try to reinforce this in the classroom. If they can't get it at home, they surely can get it here at school. If we just maintain to carry our language, carry our cultural practices, that we still can survive next 500 years, that we still can go beyond that to carry our identity, but it's entirely really up to us. Nobody has a power to come and destroy our culture and do away our language. And if we only carry this idea 
not backing off, not giving up life, not shunning anything. We still can survive in time to come because we are unique people all the way through history and we still had to look forward to carry this. And so we find ourselves on the eve of the Concentennial, faced with some of the greatest challenges that Indian people uh, have ever faced over the last 450 years, and that is how we survive uh, into the 21st century. It makes me very proud to have the heritage that I do have because I feel that that um, that my people were opposed to Spanish colonization. Later on, U.S. intrusion makes me very proud that my people think that their culture and their traditions are so important. I don't consider myself a citizen of the United States. I don't consider myself a citizen of New Mexico. I am a Taos Indian, and that's what I am. That's my nationality. You were to call it a nationality. And I, um, I'm very proud of my history of, of resistance, very proud of that history of resistance. My hope for Pueblo people is that we're, we're going to be here in a thousand years, still very clear and very strong on who we are and why we are. Um, it's mainly that that the celebration of humanity will still be very much part of our prayers. There is hope. It is in what past generations of our people have always said. As long as we keep believing in and living by the ways of our people, we will continue. As long as the story of our struggles which is like the story of all people who deeply love and respect themselves and their culture, community, and land is told, we the people will continue. Even after 450 years, the encounter of the Pueblo peoples with white men's culture continues. What will be our children's future is unknown. Still, we have a genius of enduring, of surviving the descendants of Columbus. Funding for this program has been provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by the financial support of viewers like you. Additional funding has been provided by the Rockefeller Foundation and the Native American Public Broadcasting Consortium. This is PBS.